Hi, it's Steve Hargada, and welcome to the opening keynote for the 2014 inaugural Gaming and Education Conference, an online conference. We're so excited to have Peter Stidwell here opening the conference today. We have had some pre-conference keynotes. We did some sessions during the evenings this week, and that worked out quite well. Peter, welcome. Thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here. So I appreciate you being here. Thanks to Brain Pop for their terrific support of this conference and for the American School of Bombay and their online academy. Thanks to Blackboard Collaborate for such a great platform. And this is a learning revolution program. We have virtual events on museums, libraries, school leadership, education, homeschooling, all on learning. So lots of fun. Come to learningrevolution.com. For those of you who are here in our live studio audience, you can click on the star to the left of the map. Click it twice and then click on the map. Let us know where you're participating from. And put a note in the chat as well. It's still dark outside here in California. Yanni's here, and we know she's in Indonesia, so <laughs> we keep waiting for the star to remind us that we are international. But I don't want to steal from Peter's time, so we're going to move forward. Peter, I'm here to help you. If there's anything I can do, let me know. And thanks for being here. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Peter Stidwell, and welcome to this session on the secret source, what goes into a good learning game. We're going to be taking a look behind the curtain of the whole process of educational game design, which I hope will give interesting insights for educators, players, and developers, or those interested in getting involved in developing educational games, whether that's um, as part of um, a classroom activity um, or outside of uh, the classroom. I'm executive producer at the Learning Games Network, where I coordinate the production of games as well as services and tools to help games for learning make more of an impact. So a little bit about um, the Learning Games Network. LGN is a non-for-profit organization which arose out of the MIT Education Arcade um, here in um, Massachusetts in the US. And um, it also arose out of the University of Wisconsin-Madison's Games Learning Society Center. And its founders include Scott Osterweil, Eric Klopfer, and Kurt Squire. And our president is Constant Steinkohler. And all of these guys are real veterans in the field of um, game-based learning. And our mission at LGN is to develop partnerships in technologies that boost the impact of organizations creating, commercializing, disseminating and researching high-quality educational games in order to benefit learners at every age and around the world. So we make games ourselves, we help others make games, and we make stuff that helps uh, games have more impact. We're located in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is where I am right now, and Washington, D.C. So, Let's take a look at a few examples of games um, designed and produced by LGN, um, some of which um, I'll be coming back to throughout this session to illustra illustrate the process of game design and some of the best practices. Um, so at the top left, you can see Econauts. This is an environmental science game that immerses players in a rich environment, making it difficult to observe ecological phenomena visible in a living landscape that players explore and examine to uh, explain relationships between choices that humans make and their ecological consequences. And that's a, a fairly new game. It's pretty exciting. And I'll give you links at the end to all of these um, various, different, um, uh, various different games. So we've been um, developing that over the last year and testing it and releasing it recently. And it's got um, really good reviews. And it's actually um, part of a accelerator program um, based on the West Coast here in the U.S. Um, uh, called CoLab, 
So we're looking to um, expand on that even more. At the top right, you'll see um, Zenus Isle, which is an advanced game-based social language learning application that combines a virtual world, games, activities, and community. And again, this is one we've been developing for uh, a little while. And um, this one is actually not available um, to the public at the moment because we're still sort of in our um, trial stages. But um, certainly, I'll send you a link to that um, later on as we delve into that game in a little bit more detail so that you can um, sign up for updates um, for when that becomes available. Quandry, um, the game at the bottom left there, is, was developed with uh, Fable Vision Studios. And it's an award-winning game that engages players in ethical decision-making and develops skills that would help um, players recognize ethical issues and deal with challenging situations um, in their own lives. So uh, this is a free game, and it is available um, on quandrygame.org, but also on BrainPop's um, site. And we just heard, if you um, joined us for the welcome session just ahead of this, um, Alison at BrainPop um, talking about uh, what they have to offer there. And we'll be coming back to, uh, to uh, the uh, BrainPop site and, and how it's helping in this area in just a moment as well. And then at the bottom right, um, is OzTalk, and this is a rich environment for research on how children learn programming and, um, uh, and design. And you can see that it's um, an advanced table-based game that combines the physical with the virtual. And it's actually located in the New York um, Hall, of, um, Hall of Science. So um, that's an exciting addition to um, a suite, the suite of games that we um, have available here at LGM. We have a lot more games as well, and I see someone posted the link so you can access those. So thank you for that. I wanted also to introduce a few other um, games that I've worked on personally. So before crossing um, the pond from the UK to the US, and of course, I don't know whether um, it didn't look like there was anyone from the UK earlier, but if you've been following the news um, today, the very uh, future of uh, of my native country hangs in the balance because the people of Scotland are voting whether or not they're going to go independent. And I have to tell you, it's kind of a strange feeling um, to think that your country might uh, suddenly cease to, uh, cease to exist. So it's kind of a weird day, I have to say. We'll find out later on what the result is. Um, but uh, however, uh, before crossing over to the US about three years ago, um, I worked at the UK Parliament which may seem like a weird place to do the kind of thing um, that, I'm, uh, that I do, but there was a real recognition um, within uh, Parliament um, in the role digital media plays in engaging young people, especially, um, uh, especially young people, in the work of um, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. So basically explaining about um, democracy, um, how laws are made, um, what elected politicians um, are actually um, doing. So there was a couple of games that I created um, there that you can see at the top of the screen. At the top left is MP for a Week. It's an award-winning game that drops students in the shoes of a backbench MP, a uh, member of parliament. So through play, students learn about all aspects of um, a politician's role, from debating to meeting constituents, and about um, the various um, balances, um, balancing acts that they have to um, uh, carry out um, as uh, elected officials, but also people who are part, usually part of the party and have a party um, line to toe. Um, the challenge for players in the game is to survive a week and keep their party, their voters, and the media happy. And at the top right is My UK. And My UK, in this game, students have a fresh uh, five-year term to lead their government as prime minister. And they can choose and pass new laws and realize their personal vision of the UK. Um, they have 50 original bills and um, potential laws to choose from. And at the end of each year, um, they're rewarded um, with a chance to sort of design the national, redesign the national flag, currency, um, and all of that kind of stuff as they go through the game. And then prior to my time at the UK Parliament um, Education Service, I worked at the BBC um, in London on a range of formal and informal education projects. So I don't know whether um, any of the participants here have used some of the BBC's resources. We did find that they were used you know, globally. Um, they've got a, a load of good um, games and other interactive um, resources as well. So um, if you have, have checked those out, then um, 
uh, pop it in the chat window. That would be great to hear from you. And if not, then it's, they're definitely worth checking out as well at bbc.co.uk. Um, and uh, there I worked on, on, on a, a variety of different things for kids and adults. And the bottom um, screenshot on this slide is from the science safari set of games that I produced as part of the BBC Digital Curriculum and um, BBC Jam project. And so you might wonder, well, you know, how did I get into all of this? Um, and really, it was as a kid uh, where I was playing games. And uh, then after playing games, I started tinkering around with my brother. In fact, um, we had a, a computer between us, a Sinclair Spectrum computer. And um, they had a, a coding language on there called BASIC. And we started to teach ourselves to program and to try and create our own little applications. And we tried to create our own um, little games. So um, that's how it all, all started. So I really credit um, that, combined with the fact that I used to love making things in the physical world as well as the virtual world, um, with the leading me to study engineering, um, which I um, studied at the University of Cambridge in the UK. And, and you know, I was super interested in education. And I'm super interested in, um, uh, you know, uh, in, in sort of uh, making stuff and the interaction between people and technology. And so for my master's degree, I um, worked on an online science outreach initiative, was basically creating a kind of online game um, to teach um, science and engineering. Um, so as you might imagine, I'm a big fan of the maker movement, which seems to be, you know, really taking over at this moment. Um, and of game design in school. In fact, I've, I've led a game design class here in the Boston public school system um, over the course of last year. And, um, and I, I'm a massive fan of project-based learning in general. And really, games-based learning is just a subset of, um, of project-based learning. So I can see that um, there's a few comments. Um, someone's having a problem with audio. I assume that everyone else is, is all right. So let's hope that David gets back in again and sorts out his, um, his audio. But obviously, let us know if, if other people are experiencing um, issues. OK, great. Everything, everything is working. Fine. So um, let's get started with um, the secret source behind um, you know, what goes into a good um, learning game. So on screen here is a picture of Scott Osterwell, who's one of the founders of LGN, as I mentioned earlier. But he's also the creative director at the MIT Education Arcade. And um, here he is with some of the um, legendary um, Zambini characters. Um, he was one of the two game designers at an organization also based um, here in Massachusetts called Turk, who created um, the Zambini's um, game. And I know a lot of people out there have fun memories of this game from the late 90s, uh, from the late 90s and early, uh, early noughties. And um, if there are any fans out there listening to this, any fans of Zambini's, I do suggest you check out the official Zambini's Facebook page for some exciting news, because uh, they're gearing up to, um, uh, to reboot uh, Zambini's and bring it back out to um, tablets. OK, so um, in any case, so this is Scott on screen. and. Right here, you can see the four freedoms of play. And this is a framework that um, Scott and some of his colleagues came up with um, to talk about um, gameplay and what its affordance is. But it is also something that we use on an almost daily basis to inform our um, learning game design. So you can see here um, at the top, we have the freedom to experiment. So whenever we make games, the idea is that you know, this is not a linear um, journey that players go through. Um, the idea is that you must um, allow for the player to try different things out and learn as they go along by doing, by trying, and, and also failing, which is the um, second freedom there. So this is the idea that you know, actually, we learn by doing things wrong and, um, uh, and by testing things out and um, making corrections and sort of iterating, probing, uh, making hypotheses, and then um, testing those. And when they're proved to be wrong, then we go forward and, and change those. So the idea of failure is a bit of a weird one in, in school. Um, but it's uh, actually uh, very, very important to, to, uh, to learning. 
So we have the freedom to experiment, which goes hand in hand with the freedom to fail. And then the third freedom is the freedom of identity. So, uh, and Scott talks about this um, being apparent in kids from a very early age when people, uh, when kids are just playing around and, and trying on different identities. So um, I'm sure you guys remember doing this as well. Um, so you might, you know, um, uh, play at being a cook and um, start um, uh, playing around with different recipes and ingredients. Um, and so this is really important because it helps us to probe and to think about, um, you know, what life would be like um, in, different, um, in, in different roles and to try those things out. And a lot of games, of course, do this, um, and, and this happens um, with, uh, you know, for adult players as well. So think about World of Warcraft. You set up your own avatar, um, and you sort of have this, uh, this sense of freedom from your usual everyday identity, and you are um, trying on a new role. And then the fourth freedom is the freedom of effort. And this is the idea that when it comes to play, you know, you could be totally into what you're doing and be running around. Um, the example Scott uses is playing tag. Um, so you're running around, you know, really into it, and you'll spend, um, you know, uh, hours and hours doing that. But at some point, you might be like, well, actually, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to sit out, and um, I don't want to, um, I don't want to force myself um, to to play um, uh, at this point. So it's the idea that you know, if if uh, that play is really kind of voluntary and, um, and you can put in as much effort or as little effort um, as you want. So those are the four freedoms of play and the thing that Scott talks about and which we you know, bring into our work every day is that these are also the four freedoms of learning and this is the way that we learn is to, is to you know, experiment with things, try in different identities, um, fail and try again, and um, and um, also this idea that you know um, you shouldn't be uh, that it be best. Learning is best when you're not forced into something, um, but that you're doing it kind of on your own terms. So these are some of our um, uh, uh, principles that we use, um, and um, in addition to that. Um, we translate these into what that means for you know um, for gameplay on a kind of on a, a more granular level. Uh, so we talk about um, authentic challenges. So in order to get engagement and motivation from gameplay, and um, uh, you can see that um, our first point here is about um, being authentic. So um, and this gives players a sense of agency over what they're doing. Um, you know they're they're motivated. Um, because it means something to them. Um, the second point here is learning through doing. Um, so this is um, the idea of participating. It's project-based learning. It's constructivist, um, you know, and it's goal-oriented. So it's it's less abstract than um, a lot of teaching and learning that um, that sometimes occurs. And then the third point here is. Um, to scaffold um, uh, the learning, and this is what games just do so do so well. And this is not just learning games; um, this is this is um, all kinds of games. If you think about uh, any type of game, uh, it 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 usually has tutorial levels, and it introduces concepts one thing at a time, just in time learning, so that it doesn't overwhelm you. But amazingly, by the time you come to the end of the game. Uh, you are dealing with some pretty complex um, uh, systems um, quite often. Uh, if you think about a game like SimCity, commercial game like SimCity, again like World of Warcraft or um, Civilization, um, all of these games are really, really pretty complex and they don't start off by putting you straight into the deep end, they build, um, build up the complexity as you go through it. Um, and uh, one of the other things that that helps to facilitate is this idea of flow, so that uh, and some, some of you will have heard of this. This is where you're caught in the moment almost, and you're so into what you're doing and the, and the work that you're doing or, or the game that you're playing, that time just goes by extremely quickly. And it's also linked to the idea of, of uh, ZPD, um, the zone of proximal development. So if something's too easy, it's boring, and if it's too hard, um, you give up um, because you, you feel that you can't achieve. Whereas if you're always on the edge of your comfort zone, you know, half the time you're succeeding and half the time you're failing, in fact, um, then 
uh, that's uh, that's the best place to be, and that's what games you know um, can can do so well, especially um, various digital games that um, uh, really bring uh, can react um, and personalise the experience um, to you. And then the uh, fourth point on this slide is the idea of um, uh, the social um, aspect of games, and sometimes you know games get a bit of a bad reputation um, because um, in the early days of digital games, you know, there's this uh, stereotype of kind of a young um, teenage boy um, sitting for hours playing games on their own. And, you know, even at that point, um, uh, this, is, this is, you know, certainly that did happen to a certain degree, but I was, I was someone who was playing on, on single player games, but I would often play, you know, with family members or uh, with, um, with friends. So it was, all, it was all always social. Um, at that point, at the sort of beginning of digital games, and now with the sort of uh, increased technology that's available, the um, connectedness and the, the internet and, and bandwidth provides a lot more games are much more social, which is the way that um, non-digital games have always been, and games have been and play has been an important part of you know society since uh, uh, quite a long time, and um, uh, so uh, and it's always been a sort of social. Um, a social thing, and then the final point on here, um, which we, which is, is super important, is the idea um, of um, replayability and reflection. So you can replay the games and um, reflect on on what you're doing, and um, we always try and build in as much reflection into our um, educational games as possible. But sometimes I think where there's a bit of a tension between um, uh, various gameplay mechanics that are not um, uh, that are not educational, and um, the educational requirement is that you know it's really important to um, try and build in reflection. Um, and part of that is offering, and this is what games do so well. Again, commercial games as well um, is offering a lot of feedback to players. So um, it's constant feedback, so that you know you are understanding um, what you've done wrong, and you can correct yourself. Okay. So, let's uh, so see a couple of comments have come in. Peggy, I love that all of those things just happen with good games without a teacher directing students to do them. Yeah, that's right. That's absolutely, um, that's absolutely the case. A lot of these things are already inbuilt. And um, for educational games, we try and emphasize some of these elements. And that's not to say, of course, um, that you know, uh, in terms of um, classroom use um, and, and, uh, and for educators, that you know, their role becomes redundant. That's absolutely not the case. Um, what happens is, is that um, it may it may shift the model slightly so that um, what happens is that the teacher becomes sort of a co-learner with with the students and a co-problem solver and and uh, we encourage um, teachers to really sort of um, act in a in a mentoring role and um, and you know there will still be problems in the classroom setting that come up you know the kids can't solve or you know not everyone's on the same page. Um, and some kids struggle with some games. Not all kids like games, of course. Um, like all types of games, there's so many different types of games. So um, you know, this is this is uh, where we we sort of see see this thing, um, where we see the kind of field heading. And I also should just caveat all of this with saying, you know, we don't think games are the are absolutely everything. You know, um, there 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 sh definitely has to be other. Um, other tools, games are just a tool, but they really facilitate an excellent type of um, an excellent type of learning um, uh, and uh, one that we encourage. Okay, so um, we've talked about um, the guiding principles there and the four freedoms, and I want to just jump in. I'm going to be doing this throughout the talk um, this morning um, into an example, a little case study, um, and. I introduced earlier Xenos, which was the language learning um, application. And so I just want to talk a little bit about um, Xenos, and then we'll talk about the, how this relates to the four freedoms that we were just talking about. So um, research has shown that one of the biggest barriers that language learners face is the lack of a safe and friendly space to practice, um, and uh, coupled with the fear of traditional approaches that emphasize precision over fluency. So if any of you remember that for language learning experiences, you know, sometimes they're not so, uh, they're, they're not so great um, because 
uh, and especially if you're if you're if you're if you're doing it in a voluntary setting, um, the dropout rates can be um, quite high because it's it's challenging to do, and there's often a, a massive emphasis on on accuracy and really you know confidence of trying to get people to talk to each other um, and um, have a go is uh, you know without worrying whether you got it exactly right is 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 a really important part of um, language learning. Um, and that's what we um, hope that Zenus offers. And in fact, we more than hope because we've actually done some research on this and um, found it to be very effective indeed. Um, so it offers a compelling alternative to traditional language learning programs. Um, we have task-based social games within this virtual world. We have about nine of them at the moment, and we're planning to introduce more. And it requires learners to communicate and collaborate with other players. And potentially including native speakers of, of the language um, that you're targeting as well. And so it provides opportunities to develop English reading, listening, writing, and speaking skills. And the important thing is that it's all in a low stakes environment. It's only a game, so it doesn't matter um, you know, if, you, if, you, um, if you fail. So you can experiment and fail, which is what we were talking about with the two of the four freedoms earlier. Um, and also in here, I just captured a screen um, grab at the left on the left hand side there of, um, of the um, avatar creator. So one of the first things you do in this experience is to create an avatar, which is obviously something that happens in a lot of games. But what it's, it's, it's very key um, um, here because it really allows you to set your own identity and allows you to um, express yourself and, um, and uh, provide, uh, provide you know, your character uh, in the game world um, uh, with some expressions of your own um, personality. So then, when you're in the game world, you're walking around, you can interact with other people, um, and you know, you're, you're really having a kind of social um, experience. Um, and so that's the example of, um, of Zenus. I'm just going to have a look here at the, um, at the comments. Yeah, that's an example of learning, even if you fail at the game. That's right. It, it has to be, um, it has to be um, low stakes. So, um, and you can replay and try again and keep going. So, um, that's the example of Zenus. And one, uh, uh, another example I want to share with you, I don't actually have a screenshot um, for this one, is um, a game that was created by BrainPop um, for their games um, site, and it's called um, Guts and Bolts. And um, our designers here at LGN um, helped them co sort of co-create this with, um, with, Brain with BrainPop. And Guts and Bolts is a, is a really fun game that is all about different um, body systems. Um, so respiration and digestion and circulation, all of that kind of stuff. And um, you can access this game at brainpop.com slash um, games and then just look under health games. And, or you can search for Guts and Bolts. And it's, it's a really, it's a really uh, fun, fun game where you get to put in place different parts of the human body and then connect them with pipes. And as we were designing that game, we really, really, um, you know, were always thinking about this idea of freedom to experiment. There's lots of ways you can put together the, the different body systems. And the key point is that if you get it wrong, if you fail, it's actually really funny. Um, you can sort of blow up a heart or um, you can um, have, you know, things coming out of the stomach that are not going to a place that you want them to go. So, um, you know, these, these kinds of um, things make failure interesting. Um, you learn something from it because you're getting the feedback. And at the same time, um, you know, it's funny. And, and the point about that is that it's, you know, it's saying it's okay to, to fail in this space. Um, yeah, and Alison's put up the direct link there um, to, um, to the um, game, which is uh, an award winner. And it's pretty fun. So I encourage you to check that out. It's a great way if you want to see an example of a short form game, you know, something that doesn't take you long to access, you can quickly jump into that game and see many of the principles that I'm talking about um, today. Okay, so um, I want to pivot slightly to another initiative that LGN is coordinating that helps inform our game design quite a lot. And it's called um, Playful Learning. Playful Learning is a national initiative to provide, um, when I say national, I mean within the US at the moment, although we are hoping to take it internationally as well. 
and um, it's an initiative to provide hands-on professional development to educators um, all about games-based learning and uh, to provide continued support to the people who attend our sessions and their colleagues through face-to-face -face events and an online um, knowledge base. And the project is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who, like many of us in the field, have seen many excellent games and initiatives um, that haven't achieved the scale that they deserve or you know, are being as, uh, used as effectively um, as they could do. And because of various barriers that educators face, um, uh, you know, these games are not being used as much as, um, as we might like. And there may also be things wrong with the games um, that, um, that are preventing the, 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 their use. So the point of the grant is to identify, grow, and support a nationwide movement of teachers using games effectively. And uh, we are looking to highlight great games from developers, great practices from um, seasoned games-based learning educators, and build up a, a knowledge base of tips and strategies for implementation as well as a, a network of teachers that can support each other in using, um, in using games in the classroom. So um, right here you can see um, a map, and again I know this is very US centric and this is international audience, but we're, we're, this is where we're starting because our, our, our funding is, is, is US based. Um, in our first year we've run um, workshops um, and sessions with over 1,600 educators um, through 21 events. And um, we've been experimenting with different types of events. And one of the most successful types and the most promising in terms of scaling up what we're doing are sort of uh, half-day events or even one or two-day events that are organized um, independently but with um, our support. And it's kind of like the, uh, it's like the EdCamp model um, or even sort of similar to the TED, uh, TEDx model. Um, these are sort of playful learning summits that we support uh, people use our resources, but we're not directly organizing um, them. And we see these um, summits as key to building out this ongoing um, movement. And you can see here on the screen um, some pictures from um, some of the events that we've, um, that we've, uh, that we've run. Uh, and we've run them in conjunction uh, with loads of different partners and collaborators. And if you're interested in getting involved in any way with this, um, I have uh, a, a way for you to get involved at the end of um, this session. Uh, question here, what determines where the events are held? Um, we, so the ones that we've organized ourselves, um, you know, we have um, piggybacks on the back of um, different educational um, technology events. Um, on the screen you can see FETC is one of those, MGA, EA is coming up later this year. Um, and we have also um, uh, partnered up with other developers. And we also um, have uh, got in touch with people, grassroots, you know, teachers who are really interested in, in doing these events. Um, so this question here, yes, uh, this question here, is it possible to provide a link to research that shows the impact of these games on, on learning? Um, yeah, and let me point you straight away to, um, a website called gamesandlearning.org. Um, this is um, an initiative uh, by um, the Games and Learning Publishing Council and the Joan Dance Cooney Center, where they are highlighting all kinds of great research um, and um, insights into um, use of games in the classrooms. Um, you know, it's still early days in many ways for games and learning, and a lot more research needs to be done um, about um, the impact of games and learning, but a, um, uh, a Gates uh, uh, a report from the Bill and Melinda Gates um, uh, organization um, through some, did some great work in this area and they did a literature review and they looked through a lot of research and the great news you know is that um, when the use of games based learning um, is compared against just using traditional methods on their own, game-based learning is found to have a moderate to strong, I believe the wording was, um, effect in terms of, you know, games um, in, in terms of, the, uh, of their effects. Now, it, it depends on a whole load of things. It depends on the games, it depends on how you're using them, and we would never suggest, you know, as I said earlier, that you just put games in front of kids and then that's it. Um, although there is some evidence to suggest that, you know, well-designed games um, compared to traditional methods, do a great, you know, do a great job. Um, 
but they do a much better job when combined with excellent, you know, um, moderation, facilitation, teaching as well. So um, yeah, it's it's early days, but um, but definitely exciting. So gamesandlearning.org is a great place to go, and we're going to be adding more stuff to our website, playfullearning.com, as well over the coming months. Um, we're going to add some guides about getting started using games um, and, um, and link off to various other organizations that are doing this in detail. Uh, the Mindshift blog is also doing some, some of this, and I can add a link to that at the end of, um, uh, at the end of this uh, session. So um, all that to say that you know, we have been working with a lot of teachers, and we, we've been doing it you know, for a long time. Uh, before uh, the Playful Learning Project as well, but the Playful Learning Project has really, you know, thrown a lot of light onto um, onto the details of some of uh, some of this work. Um, and you can see um, that this is um, a list. It's a long list, but it's actually a <laughs> it's actually a short shortened list of all the different barriers and um, challenges that teachers. Uh, are telling us that you know they're facing um, when they come to implement games. So I think if there's any of you out there um, looking through this list, I'd love to know whether there's anything else, any any educators out there, anything else that should be added. You know, feel free to add those into the into the comments because we're really building up this list, as I say. Um, or if if these are the things that you know really um, resonate with you, and. Um, so, so how does this all how does this all relate to to you know the game design process, which is you know what we're talking about here? Well, talking to teachers and students is of course a key 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 part of the process, and in fact, um, uh, Alison and her colleague were talking about that in the welcome um, uh, speech ahead of this um, keynote. Um, and it's important not only to get feedback on the specific game design, as we'll see later, and I'll touch on that in just a moment, but also to understand the broader requirements for games in the classroom. So um, some of these um, issues are systemic issues that go beyond um, game design, um, things like you know finding time in the curriculum, not having the right technology, um, you know, not having um, you know. Ha Districts blocking, um, uh, you know, some some areas blocking games, um, access to games. You know, that's obviously a, a big one. Um, so all of these things are sort of uh, systemic things. Uh, even the bottom one there, you know, as a teacher, not knowing how best to to use the games. But the but the great news is that you know, uh, playful learning, the initiative, along with some other great initiatives, are really beginning to um, take on and address. Some of these um, problems, and and in many cases, it's the teachers themselves who are addressing um, some of these problems. And what we're trying to do with Playful Learning and these other organisations is really bring the teachers together to sort of empower them um, and create this um, grassroots uh, number. Yeah, finding effective games number seven. Well, let me, um, uh, Yanni, I think that is. Um, let me give you some um, tools and resources to help you with that one in particular. Um, so um, on screen you'll see four great sites. Playful Learning is, is our site that we've created that does, um, you know, has a database of games. But you'll also um, find these other sites um, on there as well. So um, BrainProc, which I mentioned earlier, um, has a great collection of games. Even if you don't subscribe to um, the rest of their site, um, you can access all of their games um, on brainpop.com slash games for free. So they've done an excellent job of curating some of these short form um, educational games. And so um, you can check all of those out and they have support materials to go um, to go with all, all of those um, all of those games. These are not games that are just created by Brainpop, although Brainpop have created a few of them. Um, they've gone out and searched for partners and game developers like us. Um, and um, to feature games on on their site, so fantastic resource, and you can access those right there and right then. So we also, uh, I also want to point out, you know, there's Common Sense um, Media, um, and they have a site called Graphite.org, and Graphite.org um, is a uh, sort of review site for um, all kinds of different education, uh, all kinds of different uh, media. Uh, resources that can be used for education. So you can find games on there, you can search by 
you know, a subject area and age range. And you can do the same on Educade um, uh, as well, which is um, uh, created by Game Desk. Um, and Educate is a fantastic site as well. And and um, sort of differently from Graphite, it it it, it does concentrate more on um, it actually it actually includes um, uh, as well as games, you know, maker activities and sort of uh, augmented reality, and uh, and you can search um, by those terms as well. And they have an uh, active set of people who are uploading lesson plans and ideas for using those games. So those are great places um, uh, to check out. Um, in order to um, find games and find ways of using games and hear from other teachers. So um, there's also a new site um, which is called playfully.org, which is just getting going, um, playfully.org. Um, uh, so that's going to be one to watch um, in the future. That's by um, Glass Lab. And I apologize on this slide because um, in the transfer, the formatting has gone slightly uh, awry, so uh, please ignore that. Um, but I wanted to move on to another um, another um, case study that helps um, fix some of the problems, um, uh, some of the barriers, or uh, helps overcome some of the barriers that we were just talking about on a more um, individual level. Um, let me just go back to the questions here because I can see there's some stuff coming in. So Danny has very helpfully added a list to uh, a link to to the mind mind shift um, article. So thank you for that. That's got some good um, research in there. And um, Peggy is saying, is there an issue with bandwidth when all of the students in a class are logged into a game? I'm guessing there might be. Yeah, I mean, you know, these things depend so much on the way that the classroom is set up. But it's certainly the case. You know, going back to that list of of barriers. You know, when we <laughs> When we uh, look at some, you know, look at this list, we've got to be, as game developers, we have to be very mindful that we're trying to reduce loading times. I mean, we're trying to have a, create a great experience, and we want to, we want to have it be rich media and lots of audio and sometimes video. Um, but we also have to be very mindful of, of loading times, and obviously, we are mindful of the fact that technology in school is sometimes a little bit outdated. You know. It, when you're sat in your game development studio and you have the fast Wi-Fi and you have, you know, the graphics card, sometimes you get a little bit estranged from what it's like, which is why it's so important to go into classrooms um, all of the time. So, yeah, some people do find there's, there's issues, but um, uh, hopefully it's a well-designed game. Um, in most cases, it's, um, it's okay. All right, so let me just go forward again um, to the quandary case study. So um, let's take another um, take another look at this one um, because what I want to do is to, is to show you that there's loads that we do as developers informed by what teachers have told us that we think you know is best practice for supporting um, the use of games in the classroom. So Quandary is a game designed to develop ethical thinking skills, including um, perspective taking, which is also referred to as empathy, um, critical thinking, and decision making. And um, in this game, players are welcome to planet Braxos, home of a new human colony, 32 light years from Earth. And the player is captain of the colony, faced with ethical dilemmas that the colonists can't resolve. And they have to make difficult decisions in which there's no clear right or wrong answer. Um, but there are important consequences um, uh, to uh, themselves, to others in the colony, and to the planet Braxos. So that's the game story, and um, uh, it's definitely worth checking out. Again, it's free. You can find it at quandrygame.org. It's also available on BrainPop, um, so multiple ways of getting this. And, um, and what you'll find on both BrainPop and qu on the website quandrygame.org is a load of supporting resources for teachers in particular. So we have an implementation video that shows how the game can be used in the classroom. Um, uh, Question here from Yanni. Um, there's a version of Quandry for iOS, if, if I'm not mistaken. You are not mistaken. There definitely is. It's also available on. Um, uh, it's also available uh, for Android tablets. So um, uh, so iOS tablets and Android tablets, and you can download it for free. Yeah. So we also have a game guide, and that is a PDF document that you can print out easily that shows you, you know. 
the flow of the game and where the learning is taking place in each point. Uh, we have a sample lesson plan. We have um, you know a sample worksheet, and we know that teachers love to take those and do their own stuff and remix them, and that's obviously absolutely fine. And then we've mapped it to um, the English language arts um, uh, common core state standards. And um, so um, again, uh, that's most relevant, of course, um, in the US, but um, uh, we're looking to sort of bring this uh, the mapping into other countries um, as well. And then we have a player, teacher, and parent discussion forum, so that all of this um, stuff, you know, we, we were providing peer support for all of the um, all of the different um, uh, stakeholders involved. Um, so, so we do this kind of thing for all of the different um, games that we provide. So, if you're looking to get into games, it's great to try and find some of uh, games that have this kind of material. And most, and all of the games on the BrainPop site do exactly that. And you can go to Educate, you can go to Playful Learning, and find all of this kind of stuff. Okay, so um, that is Quandary. Now, we've spoken about guiding principles and seen some of the barriers that teachers have told us that they face, um, and we've seen ways that we can overcome some of that. So let's now dive into the nitty gritty of game design. How how do we come up with the game mechanics, which is you know what the players will actually be doing in a game? Well, our process is that we first identify the area that we're trying to cover, and we list out the high-level learning objectives. So, for instance, in the example on the screen, this is the great ice scape. And I'm, I, I, I'm so I was in two minds about whether to include this, because this game doesn't exist anymore, because um, this is something that I did at BBC about 15 years ago. But I just wanted to, it was a good example to show you um, what I'm about to talk to about, although now I realize, you know, um, it's maybe disappointing that you can't actually play it, but there are other games like this actually out there. Um, so, uh, so in this game, what we were trying to do, we were tasked with creating, you know, an experience about forces um, for lower key stage two students in the UK um, learning science physics. Um, so those are people aged um, about seven um, to nine years old. And so what we did is we worked with curriculum specialists, teachers, and students to identify the deeper learning objectives about forces and friction. And we also identify common misconceptions, because that was something we wanted, to, um, we wanted to address in this as well. And then we ask ourselves, what's really interesting about this content? And we often talk to subject matter experts to find out from them what really motivates them about their work. And we're often looking you know, for them to answer the question. Uh, what we're looking to answer ourselves is, where is the game in this content? And gamers are systems of rules. So what are the rules and what are the goals that we can draw out? And here's the key. What you want to do is you want to align the learning objectives with the game objectives. A bad learning game separates out these two. And it's easier to do it that way, but you end up with you know, not only a bad educational experience, but probably even just a bad game. So in the worst of these examples, um, you know, it, 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 of bad learning games, they reinforce the idea that learning, so the learning part is dull and the gaming part is fun. So, you know, answer this dull question about learning and then you get this reward. And that's not what we're trying to do um, at all. What we're trying to do is, is to emphasize, you know, how interesting the learning is and, um, and uh, ensure that people are engaged in that and, and pull out the um, really cool parts. So, um, so in that process, it's often the case that you should concentrate on fewer learning objectives in the game rather than trying to pack in everything, including the kitchen sink. It's OK that some of the learning in a particular area should take place outside of the game. Uh, what we try to do is to get players thinking and reflecting on the material so that they get a sense of the underlying patterns or frameworks, and they can uh, build on that. Uh, they have a solid base on which to build. So um, you know, in this example, we can see we, we've got kids experimenting um, with forces here. They can change um, the push force that uh, initiates the, uh, the snowboarding cow. And then there's a target on the screen that they have to get to, which is um, right here. And so they have to get the snowboarding cow in this ice cream factory um, to the target. And they can do that by altering the push, and they can do that by altering the friction. And what you've got here is a harder level, because in this version, there's two variables to change at the same time. And that's, kind of, that's quite complicated. 
um, uh, especially for kids to think about when uh, and what we do first is introduce just the push or just friction and then we introduce um, both of those um, together in the harder levels. So many STEM subject areas lend themselves quite well to games because the rules are defined by the laws of nature. It's, in this case, you know, there's Newton's laws. So it's, you know, it's sometimes, I think, easier to think about um, uh, game mechanics for some of these um, science, technology, engineering, mathematics subjects. Um, but that's not to say that you can't create great games for, for um, social studies, uh, history, and all kinds, you know, all kinds of other subjects as well. So let's turn back to quandary as an example, because this is a great one. Um, in this game, and again, you know, it's freely available and it's quick to play, um, you have to interview various different um, people um, on the planet that are facing this ethical dilemma. And the way that you do that is to choose, um, you know, um, which you ask them about different solutions. So, you know, uh, what do you think of this solution to the problem? Or what do you think of this one? And so you drag those into place and you hear what the person has to say about that particular solution. Um, so there's actually a lot, although it's in small chunks, there's a lot of reading in here. So teachers love this game for, um, you know, English and language arts. Um, as well as critical thinking, reasoning, um, and um, moral development, which is the, uh, the sort of high-level learning objective here. And once you've found out what they think of a particular solution, you then can present different facts to them. And you, the idea is to, that you present relevant facts that change people's minds, or at least inform them. And so you've got to really think about what is, what is the fact that they don't know and that might change their mind. So there's a lot of high order um, thinking going on in here. And so there's still a game system, still rules, but you know, we're not talking about science content here, we're talking about critical thinking um, and reasoning. So um, that's the case study of um, Quandary. Um, I'm just gonna whip on through that case study because we've already talked about that. Because I wanna talk about the um, the iterative, um, you know, game design process. And this is about user-centered design. Um, so we've talked about goals, and then you can imagine that you also have to add in obstacles. We've got to have that feedback that we were talking about and the failure state. Um, but, you know, you've got this great idea. Um, but you don't just make it and then you're done. And game design is a very iterative process. And um, you need to get feedback every step of the way through playtesting. Uh, and also, you know, even earlier than that, you can show ideas to, uh, to uh, teachers, to students, uh, and other players, and see what they think. Uh, you can do it from a very early stage using paper prototypes or simple digital prototypes. So we often test things um, just on paper. We just map things out, um, write things up, and, um, and, um, and explain what the game is um, to a group of kids and then have them play with very simple um, sort of uh, pieces of paper and um, uh, written statements. Um, so getting feedback on a game idea right at the start of the process is extremely, extremely useful. And, um, but you must be careful about the types of questions you ask. We've got to be careful about um, open-ended questions, which is something that I learned when I was creating this game, MP for a week, um, which I mentioned earlier, tells you about what, uh, you know, elected representatives of the UK Parliament um, do. So it puts you in the shoes of one of those people. And when we ask kids uh, what kind of game they wanted to see about Parliament, and we asked it in that really open-ended way, you know, a lot of the kids were talking about wanting a shooting game within the halls of the historic Palace of Westminster. And why not? You know, that sounds like a cool game, but obviously it's not going to meet the objectives that we, that we had. Um, and so this is a problem with focus groups as a whole and something that we have to be careful about. And there are much better approaches, um, which I've since learned. Um, so, you know, getting kids involved in the actual design process themselves, um, including deciding which learning objectives would be most suitable for the game. So once they, under, you know, once they understand the, um, the, cons the constraints and the objectives of what you're trying to do, you get much better responses and um, great ideas. So that's in the, um, that's, uh, in the really early stage. Um, then you will go forward and you'll iterate designs and game mechanics. And as you test, you need to check the usability. You know, can you actually uh, use the, use, the interface? Does it make sense? 
you want to test for engagement, and then of course we're in learning games we're testing for understanding as well. So um, there's assessment built into this as well. Um, one warning: if you do have students as co-creators, or if you find yourself going back to the same group for play testing sessions, you might get skewed results. You must also test with new sets of players as you continue. People who are not familiar with the game at all, and the reason for that is because you know once you know what's supposed to happen, um, that really Paint the uh, paint the experience. So you must always get fresh fresh blood in to test as you go forward. Um, and I just wanted to quickly mention the idea of transgressive play here. So in this game, in People Week, the idea is that you um, are balancing the needs of your party, um, of uh, your voter support, and how the media is portraying you. And um, as you go through, you know, you're creating speeches or or selecting who, which witnesses should appear on a certain committee, and um, and trying to get the attention of the speaker in the in the in the chamber, in the House of Commons chamber, and you know we allow people to play um, to lose almost uh, because uh, it's a balancing act between these three things, and you will find that some kids will want to sort of uh, subvert the process and try and do as badly as possible. And that's just what some, you know, some people like to do, um, and that's fine. I think it's, it, it, you know, absolutely fine to allow people to to uh, to do that. If the game is designed well, you are learning stuff anyway because you have to figure out and think what is the answer that's going to most upset people, for instance. So you know, that's an interesting point, um, and I think it's something that it, it should be, uh, uh, you know, definitely considered when you're designing games. Uh, question here. I've heard that many student games designers don't really care about playing their games, own games as much as they do designing them. They want to keep creating. How common is that? Um, well, um, it it really depends. I mean, when so this is this is uh, this is why we have this. We actually have something called the Game Design Toolkit. There's other stuff that's out there as well, which really encourages people, as I was just saying, to test as you go through. I mean, I think in some ways, you know, if students are really into designing games um, and they're working on that and they're getting skills out of that, then that's great. But it is true, you know, in the in the real world, game design, educational game design or commercial game design, you really need to test them as you go through. So I would definitely encourage um, encourage that. And it is something that you do need to encourage students um, to do, um, absolutely. Another question, if you never fail in a game, does that mean it's not designed well and not challenging enough? I think that probably is um, probably is the case. I think if you don't, you know, if you don't, Go through, and you don't, um, uh, and you you don't do anything wrong. Then it's probably probably not that interesting. Um, so um, yeah, I think it's in, it's important, and and you're probably not um, figuring a whole lot out. So uh, I think failure is definitely a big part of of, of game. Um, does the reward in game designing come from getting other players um, others to play their game a lot? Um, it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. There's certainly people, you know, out there who create games, and this goes to the last point as well. Um, you know, more just for themselves and more as sort of pieces of art. And there's some great games that have come out um, because of that. So, you know, there's different there's different ways of approaching it. There's definitely different uh, ways of approaching it and getting um, experience from that as well. Um, but yeah, as Danny says, students love to play their own and others' games. Okay, so um, I wanted to just finish off here. Uh, we've got one minute left, so running out of time, but we have answered some questions as we go through uh, on some learnings here. And, um, you know, quick recap find the right game mechanics. Don't just limit yourself to facts. Um, think about skills um, as well as content. Um, be careful with gamification elements. So, you know, you've got to think about the gaming mechanics, not just the scoring. Not just the leveling, uh, not just the badges. It's really important to, um, to 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 get the game mechanics right and test regularly and keep it simple. Keep testing simple to make sure that you do it um, to do it often. And the last thing I would like to say is that as part of our playful learning initiative, we're asking the question: What new learning games would you like to see? Um, because we would love to get um, educators and other people's. Um, uh, opinions on that. It's a question that's not asked that much. So I've just um, set up a little thread on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash playfullearn. Um, if you have ideas or suggestions, please let us know. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for listening. 
Um, I hope this has been useful. And uh, I'll stay around in the chat for a little bit longer to answer questions um, that we didn't have a chance to get to. But thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the day um, in the gaming and Thanks, Peter. <laughs> I'm going to encourage you to have people put your email in there, have them maybe email you questions because we do have a set of sessions coming up and we don't want people to be held back from going there. Terrific job. Thanks. I'll put my email in here now and then people can email me and get on to the, uh, to the next session. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, everybody. Some good sessions coming up. Talk to you soon.